think we're recording. Well, aloha everyone. Uh, this is Jeremiah. If you haven't got to meet me yet, I am the Director of Campus Ministry here at Chaminade University. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, as you probably have heard, this is a new series that we're starting. Uh, amidst all the changes, all the things that's going on, uh, as a group to be able to share uh, share some things that are hopeful and encouraging and joyful. And so uh, that's what our hope is for this series called Share the Joy. We want to be able to have people from our community give their stories of hope and encouragement and, of course, joy um, for those who need it, which is all of us, right? Uh, so we have some very awesome people today that's going to start us off for our very first one. And uh, before I introduce them, I'd like to go ahead and just ask God's blessing over our time. And in the theme of today, uh, of today's Share the Joy, uh, this joy of creation, there's a prayer from uh, Pope Francis and Laudato Si, which is about the climate, about our environment, about uh, the, the world and creation. And uh, I'm just going to ask God's blessing over our time and use one of those prayers for us as we get started. So uh, wherever you may be, if you want to just take a moment and um, ready your heart and mind for today, and we'll ask God's blessings for this time. So let us just take a moment in silence here. When we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain, at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our loving Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as I mentioned before, we have two lovely individuals that are going to start off our very first Share the Joy. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, welcome uh, with warm aloha from a virtual distance of however far we are. Uh, Father Marty, who is upstairs, and uh, Dr. Gail Grabowski, who is, I'm not even sure where she is. She's in a cool virtual looking place with a glass globe in the back. Um, but to get us started off today uh, with both these individuals, I'm just gonna do a little bit of the introduction for each one of them. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gail Grabowski. If you don't know a little bit about Dr. Gail, let me just share. She is currently professor, professor and director of environmental programs and interim dean of natural sciences and mathematics here at Chaminade University. She has been the director of Chaminade's environmental programs since their inception in 2000. The program has won a number of awards for its commitment and excellence in carrying out service learning, and citizen science projects in the community. Dr. Gill has published an award-winning book called 50 Simple Things You Can Do to Save Hawaii and has appeared as a science character in National Geographic Sea Studios series. 
the shape of life. She was appointed as governors Cayetano and Lingle to serve on the state's environmental council for eight years, the last two years as chair. She has also helped advise on policy and education as a member of the advisory council for the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Coral Reef Ecosystem Reserve. Now known as, I am not gonna pronounce that, I'm gonna totally butcher this Hawaiian name here, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's a national monument and a world heritage site in Hawaii. She earned her bachelor's and PhD in zoology from Duke University. It is with great pleasure to have our first presenter, Dr. Gail Grabowski, share with us and be with us today. Thank you, Dr. Gail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. Thank you, everyone, for asking me to do this talk. What a Candyland talk. The only, you know, for me, I was like, what? 10 minutes to talk about the most important thing for all of us, which is all of us, um, writ large. So um, I'll, I will try to keep this to 10 minutes. I was, uh, I, it was kind of challenging you know, the environmental guys know we end up going from joy. We want to fix things. We have a vision, right, of that, that we spend some time figure, trying to figure out what the vision is of what is, what would the world be if things were ideal. But um, we, we rapidly go from joy to sadness a lot, you know. So I was telling Father Marty, it's like, oh boy, if I talk just about climate change, we'll have to change the title of this. But we're going to think, hopefully, yeah, about solutions. And we have solved some things. So um, I thank you so much. And I'm going to Try to keep it positive and the students that are here will have will be familiar with sort of our tension between despair and you know joy trying to fix things so um i i i think we are in a wonderful place to, to consider this not only are we at chaminade and not only does does pope francis rock i taught a whole class on laudato si it is so the students loved it so leaving that to Father Marty, but it was just, to everybody, that is a wonderful document, whether you're a science major or a religion major or anywhere in between, right? Um, and so we're also in Hawaii where this, the malama, right? The Hawaiian culture, the, so, so, the, the well-being of nature is super tied to the well-being of humans. And it's just, it's just, I don't want to say baked in, I get tired of that cliche, but it's so strong. Um, I picked this picture in the background because this is one of those pictures that to me, and it's, this is a very famous picture from one of the Apollo missions where they looked back at the earth from the moon, you know, and so how often do we look back, not from within? And boy, does it make the point, we are here. <laughs> we have this finite space. Now there's maybe infinite possibilities, but it is our home. And I don't know about you guys, but when we start talking about taking spaceships to Mars and all living there, when I hear what the conditions will be like, it doesn't sound like a better place. So we need to look after our amazing place. And I, I know we all know that. So I first thought I'd start out with creation. So I, because it's the month where we what honor St. Francis, who is my patron saint, uh, surprisingly, right? And so this is a picture of an amazing piece of creation that maybe not a lot of people have seen because we all love nature and see many things that we love. But this is um, the mesophotic zone in Papahanao, Mokuakea, which it took me a long time to learn how to say that, Jer Jeremiah. And this is um, about at 300 feet. And who would have thought there was so much coral and so many fish down there? Just so beautiful which is something that no one has to teach us what beauty is in nature. I mean, I think it's in us and it's old and God put it there and evolution put it there. So looking at that, now I have a crazy figure for you all. Don't panic. My students kind of panic. But the, the reason I picked these two is just to show you that this is reality. And in the West, we may have sort of atomized the universe and viewed things as separate objects. But these are two real causal networks, which is how the students know this because they're young. Everything's connected, right? We can talk about creation as one, you know, interdependent, unified, you know, amazing whole. This happens to be the pathway for digesting food, which I got in grad school, and this happens to be the great cod fishery off the Georges Banks, who eats who. But things are connected in creation. Yeah, we are connected and we are connected to it all. And I know we know that. I just wanted to make the point because there's good things about this and bad things about it. The, the, the sort of bad side is there's a whole bunch of ways to mess it up. Yeah, if, you, if we take out the codfish, which we did indeed do, 
that's going to cause a lot of problems, not just for fishermen and people that love to eat cod. Um, but the other side of the coin is that it also means there are lots of solutions, right? There are many ways in to fixing. There are many, I always tell the students, no matter your major, you can be part of the causal network that is the fix to say climate change, right? To creation. So we need eco ec economists, we need politicians, we need scientists, we need indigenous values, we need religion, we need it all. Yeah, we need education and media and calm and all that. So just back to another beautiful picture of creation. Now look at that and just see the connectedness. It is all connected. When we, when we harm things, right, when we add things or subtract or bring new things in or do, th or do things in greater scales, right, we are working into that system and often to the detriment, which is a hard thing to define. What does that mean? But just, just for that, I just wanted us to, to see the complexity of things. Many potential problems, but many fixes. So what has happened? Well, I, I turned for, to a quote from one of my favorite authors, Lorian Isley, who wrote, I believe this was in the 60s, in the book, The Firmament of Time. And he, he writes a book on how human is man. You know, what, what, who are we? Why are we here? And some of his quotes are small. Um, I ended up highlighting the whole book and I have my students read some pieces of it. Um, that what have we done? The life in the pond in the thicket is not equipped for the storms that shape the human world. Yeah. So he's, he's looking at sort of the disharmony and he calls it the whirlpool, which I always thought was very powerful. We've now reached a point where we must look deep into the whirlpool of the modern age, the stability of nature on the planet, that old and simple promise to the living, which is written in every sedimentary rock, is threatened by nature's own product, man. So he's, he mourns the whirlpool, he calls it. That's why I put a whirlpool in the background. And then, he, then just to, to not read all of this one, but he's hard on the West. The Western scientific achievement, great though it is, has not concerned itself enough with the creation of better human beings, nor with self-discipline. It has concentrated instead upon things and assumed that the good life would follow. Therefore, it hungers for infinity. So I always thought, wow, this is such, such a good quote about consumerism in a sense, yeah, and materialism. So what? let's just look for a minute at one example of the whirlpool. And this is a figure from a pretty recent paper in the, uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And what it basically shows, I call this an example of the whirlpool here, is that if we continue on this path of CO2 emissions and methane emissions and climate change, we might actually hit what the scientists call a nonlinear, some sort of threshold where we just can't say it's going to get warmer and warmer on an even curve. It's like the COVID curve. It could be exponential and the earth falls into a hothouse earth, you know, a hell on earth where it is, it is absolutely impossible to go back. Some people hypothesize Venus went through this. So we the whirlpool needs some attention. <laughs> and I think we know that for many other issues. Um, so then I turned to Thomas Berry, who's another author that I just love. And I believe Thomas Berry was a Catholic priest. You guys can tell me if I'm right. I, I looked and I've forgotten. And he also was into Buddhism. And he says this quote that I just love. The universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects, right? We are all connected. So we've created a whirlpool and we can't go into the details here. If you major in environmental, we go into the details all the time, but we need, we are all one. We need to work together. We hear it all the time now. Let's work together. And not everybody's on that page, right? Not everybody's out for the common good. I love that Catholic term of the common good. Um, so maybe what, how do we get out of the whirlpool? And in 23 years of teaching, I think there's three pieces and one, of course, is knowledge. If we don't know what's going on, we think you can drink disinfectant to kill the coronavirus, right? If we don't understand what's going on, we don't know that species are becoming extinct. We wouldn't have even known CO2 was higher in the atmosphere if we couldn't measure it. And then the implications of what that means. So, of course, we need knowledge. That's part of what college is about, right? Then we need values. Guys, this was my realization as a scientist, was the scientists love nature. That's why they study it, right? They love whatever aspect from the atom to the 
you know, galaxy to the critters in between and the humans. But the, the values piece, you start to realize as scientists, we can document decline all day long, but if we don't have people who want to make change, who have a value set that would lead to sustainability or whatever we define the common good as, we're in big trouble. And then the last one, which I'm sure, I'm sure Father Marty and Catholics, you guys are the priests and the brothers are always talking about, how do we change values and get action to happen? Yeah. So I gave this figure in a conference. Um, I went to this Oxford round table years ago. It was called Science and Religion. But it really has come down to, to me to watch over the years that, yes, we need the knowledge and we need the values, right? And that's a, that's a long discussion, the environmental ethics, the values around nature. How do we fit in? How should we treat it? And do we all have to have the same values or do they have to just lead to the same outcome via different paths maybe? But then there's the praxis, the action part. And one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, Michael Soule, who's a conservation biologist, and he says, facts about extinction compute, but they don't convert. So for some people, facts lead to action, but not for everybody. So here's three hypotheses. And my question to you guys is, I, I could ask three, but what are the barriers to science? That's something we ask. What is it? Why does not everybody good at critical thinking and understand science. What are the barriers to values? I think Father Marty's probably gonna address that more than me, but we think about this in the environment. How do we get people to recycle? How do we get people to buy an electric car? You know, whatever, whatever. And then acting, that one is in there too. The values and the action are closely tied. So I've got, I, I wanted to look a little depth into those three answers and I'm trying to watch the clock here. Okay, so this is just a Google Drive page from one of my classes. It's, it's the beginning introductory marine science class and it's in the issues and this is the issue of climate change. And these are all handouts and documents they read or they give a presentation about. You know, there are pie charts about, you know, where, what are we spending? Where does the energy go? Who's emitting the most? What's it doing to the land? What's it doing to our health? What's it doing to sea level rise? What, how do we get people to become literate, right? The knowledge piece. We need more of that. And you guys know it. We can't get away. We can't let people get away with saying it's a hoax. So we're doing that at school, right? We're learning. The students know. I have so many students that tell me they have conversations at home and they're trying to convince their family or their roommate about climate change, right? So the knowledge piece. So I just wanted to show you three quick pictures of knowledge, pursuit, in action. This is not a great uh, photo picture because it's a photograph and I took it two weeks ago at the Papahanaumokuke Advisory Council meeting. And we've got the director of the whole monument, it's 1200 miles from um, Niihau all the way up to Cure. We've got William Isla, who's our chair, who who is um, held many positions. I think he's in Department of Hawaiian Homes now. And Dan Pohemas, who's the head of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here. And we're just watching the presentation. We get this every three months. And here's a climate change, very recent photograph from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the USGS about warming. And everything that's red is hotter than it was in 1981 to 2010. So we get some knowledge. We're having a hot year and there's a hot blob up above Hawaii. Okay, now here's a better picture of the hot blob from some satellite data, more knowledge. It's not hitting the Hawaiian Islands. Maybe we're gonna be okay with coral bleaching. You know, we're learning, we're learning. Now that's not policy, it's just knowledge. It's not values or action, but it can, it can be a part of it. Here's Hawaii um, in May this hot blob made its way down to the Northwesterns. So we actually are having warmer waters in some of the Northwestern islands are more, more warmer than average than we're having on the mains. And then if we look at the conclusions, so here's the not joyous part, you guys, but the knowledge is a start, right? So, you know, this is the second hottest year on record. And this is brand new, this is like two weeks old. Um, there doesn't look like there's gonna be an El Nino this year, but there's a 90% plus probability of thermal stress on the corals of the monument up north there. Um, we've also had some, some cyclones already and the sea levels continuing to rise at three to five millimeters. So those are facts, yeah. Then we go to values. So if we're gonna get to the joyous state of fixing things, we've gotta have values. And this is one of my favorite pictures of Pope Francis trying to talk some sense into some oil executives. Right, you guys remember that? He brought, he brought all of the uh, CEOs into the what, the Vatican? And he talked to them about the earth. 
Yeah. And I just, you got to say Pope Francis is a rock star. I mean, he's so amazing about looking after creation and he's a scientist by training. So he's, he's so versed in both the knowledge and the values piece. And then on the personal level, I took this off my mirror in my bathroom where it's been for probably 20 years. And my mother gave it to me probably when I was confirmed and I made St. Francis my patron saint. And I learned some of my values from this guy because my family was a nature family and we loved him. And I look, I have this, if you look at this, right, you have been named a patron of the environment. <laughs> so I was probably, what are you, eight years old? And the message got to me, oh, I got to look after the critters. Well, here I am, right? So we get our values. We, the students and I, we talk about this a lot. We just had the conversation the other day. You can get them in church. You can get them from a sermon. You can get them from service. You can get them from nature, from your families, from TV shows, from documentaries. If we were indigenous Hawaiian, or if we were, you know, back in the day when we all knew we were dependent on nature, this was very important learning how to treat it right? How to find food, how to respect it, how to live in it, how to not get killed by a poisonous snake. So values. And lastly, guys, action. This one is tricky. There's, this is the, the, the environmental world right now is in this position of asking the question, how do we get people to act? And we know those first two pieces matter. And there's a lot of discussion around the values piece. I'll just give you an example. On a situation like this where the students and I went up and planted native Hawaiian plants up in a refuge, there was people that were there for cons uh, creation restoration. So they were there for a very religious, that was their value system. And then there were ecologists there to look after ecosystems, you know, and take care of endangered species. So the point is there can be different motivations for action, but, but actually getting to what they are is, is a job that sociologists are helping us with now. And we know one, one or two things is a peak experience. If people have an experience in nature that they never forget or multiple experiences. Yeah. And so look at this one. I love this picture because it, it required knowledge. These guys all know about climate change. It required values. You know how long it took everybody to paint? These are all Shamanat students to paint these signs and to put this up on the wall in the loose center and use the guardians of the galaxy and, you know, paint that we are the guardians of creation. And all the ladies in the front row are from Pacific Islands. So we, we had the, we had the value, they had the value system already. That's part of the challenge to the public. And they learned the knowledge and then we acted. And look, we ended up leading the whole climate change parade. And then lastly, there's some things that we are ignoring as a culture. And I know you guys all know this, but an example, I taught a class called uh, Sustainable Tech and Ecological Restoration. And the students, we actually looked at products and we developed our own spreadsheet for what a product how good is a product? Is it sustainable? Does it decrease an ecological footprint? Does it have cradle to cradle? Does it lower cost? Does it restore or repair? So this does not exist. There, Walmart was thinking about doing a green label. They never did it. You, things sell if they sell. How sad is that, right? Our values are wrong. We need to say they sell if you know they're good. And we have to define what that means. And lastly, guys, some happy stuff is, did you know, for example, that some countries don't keep track of GDP like it was the end all of existence. They keep track of things like gross national happiness. That's Bhutan. It's a very serious measure in Bhutan and it has all of these characteristics, psychological well-being, health, time, education, cultural diversity, good governance, community vitality, resilience of the ecosystems, living standards. Now, I think both of these are missing religion and faith and sacredness, a sense of the sacred, which was kind of weird to me. Yeah. But also here's another one that's very widely used, the social progress index, which has, these are all have a lot of subcategories, but there's basic human needs, foundation of well-being and opportunity. Why don't we measure that in America? But some countries do. So you guys find joy in that. U.S. was number 18, I think, in the last few years on this one. And then um, lastly, just look at the potential for this. More sunlight hits the earth in a single hour than we consume in a year. So we could, all we have to do is capture this in a renewable way, right? And we could have energy. We've just chosen to get it from fossil fuels, okay?
And I know I've gone on too long, right? So I'll have to stop there. But I, I did have a story this summer that I think I'm not a person that particularly believes in miracles, but there was so much coincidence to my story that in a nutshell, I saw a fisherman catch a, a large puffer fish, which you can't eat, and throw it down on the wall at Almoana and then kill it. And it just broke my heart. It was a big fish. It was probably 30, 40 years old. And then I walked by two weeks later and I saw a little puffer fish trapped in some fishing line in the same spot. And then I, I said, I was sat there looking at it and a couple walked by and said, what are you looking at? I said, this trapped little puffer, he's going to die. And they got in the water and helped me. And we borrowed some wire cutters from the sailboat across the way. And the guys and the Cushman in the park came up and gave us some shears. They were taking care of the park and it took us an hour. And that little puffer fish was puffed up like a spiky tennis ball. And we finally got it free. And then it floated and rolled and we thought he died. And then like a minute later, he exhaled air and the fish swam away. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a story. We all work together under imperfect circumstances to save one little fish. I mean, we are capable of greatness. And so feel joy in that, guys. It's just the path there, right? We got to have tenacity. And that's all I have. And I'm sorry I went over. And thank you very much. Um, and I'm ending the share however we do that in show. And my question is, you guys, how do we get through the barriers of the science, knowledge, and the action? Because I think Father Marty's got the, got the other covered. You got the values. You guys know more about how to get people to take on values. Dr. Gale, that was, that was very valuable. And uh, we thank you so much for that. What a joy. And uh, just to hear about the, the fishing story. <laughs> Um, it, there's so much truth into that, Dr. Gale. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, as we, we talk about this idea of joy of creation, uh, Dr. Gale brings a, a wealth of knowledge from, of course, the scientific side. And, and there's so much to learn there. As she mentioned in these, these three different things, there's an importance to the uh, knowing something and then bringing some action to that, and, uh, but the, also the values portion. And so um, what I want to do is uh, we're going to, that's a great segue into uh, our next person, our next guest today that's going to be speaking a, a little bit more about, about these values. And by way of introduction, uh, you guys, most of you probably have met him before. If you haven't, he's a great guy. He's on the second floor of Ching Hall. But let me just describe uh, Father Marty for just a moment. So Father Marty is a chaplain here at the university. He has served as provincial of the Marianas province of the United States from 2010 to 2018. So he was a, he had a big wig. He was one of the, the boss men. Father Marty was born in Cleveland, Ohio, where he met the Marianas while attending St. Joseph High School. Upon graduation, Father entered the Marianas novitiate at Marcy in New York. He professed his vows in 1967 and was ordained as a priest in 1978 in Dayton, Ohio. After many years in secondary education in Michigan and Ohio, Father Marty began more than 27 years of ministry in Eastern Africa. He was the novice director for African Marianists for seven years and regional superior of Kenya, Malawi, and Sambia for nine years. Father served as manager for Our Lady of Nazareth Primary School in Nairobi, where he was actively involved in the school's develop, development for more than 13 years. Also at the school, there was 2,000 children from a slum all in Nairobi. He received a bachelor's degree in philosophy and English from the University of Dayton and a master's degree in religious education from Boston College. Father Marty also earned a Master of Divinity degree from the University of St. Michael's College in Ontario. Please welcome our very own chaplain here at the university, Father Marty. Thanks, Jeremiah. And thanks very much, Gail. That was really wonderful, wonderful presentation. Jeremiah described you as lovely, which is really true. But he described me as lovely, too. I think there's another word. <laughs> By the way, Thomas Berry was a Catholic priest. He died in 2009, and he was 94 years old, and he described himself as a geologian. geologian. 
wanted to um, uh, welcome especially a young man who's zooming in from Kenya, a uh, first year student, new first year student called uh, Irvin Gatenya. He'll be here on campus hopefully in January. But uh, Irvin, you're very welcome and glad you could make that. Uh, there are some similar themes from uh, what uh, Dr. Gale um, presented, and I'm going to amplify those if I can get this to work. So as Gail said as well, I've been very uh, much influenced by Pope Francis and by his encyclical Laudato Si, uh, we praise you, we give praise to you. Uh, but this um, has also been des designated as a season of creation from the 1st of September, which is a day that Pope Francis has set until the 4th of October, the feast, the actual feast of St. Francis of Assisi. And this is a, a season that is being observed not only within the Catholic community, but within many of the Christian denominations and probably other religious groups as well. Uh, concern for the creation, especially during these days. Here are a couple of questions that maybe you can think about as we go through this. Uh, estimates say that each of us generate, on average, about 4.4 pounds of garbage daily. Now think about that, 4.4 pounds of, of garbage daily. Maybe a question is, concretely, how can I reduce this? The second question is, what can we do here at Chaminade on the campus beyond the recycle bins, which we have, maybe through OCEL, maybe through campus ministry, that might uh, be able to help us focus more on conservation, sust uh, sustainability, and recycling. And then finally, and I liked uh, Gail's use of this uh, phrase as well, integral ecology, that comes from Laudato Si. How might concern for an integral ecology, that means both the earth and the people, be expressed in whatever vocation uh, I embrace. There are four takeaways that I'd like to talk about from uh, the, the encyclical and then amplify a couple of them especially. The first important takeaway is that discussions of the environment now, certainly within the Catholic community, but within other religious communities as well, it has a spiritual and a faith perspective, and that is now part and parcel of the discussion. So in other words, words, we bring our faith to bear on these kinds of questions. That's not always been the case. And in, uh, in the thinking of many people, um, you know, it's a scientific question, it's a social question. What Pope Francis is saying is that it's also a religious question. Creation is a holy and precious gift from God to be reverenced by all people and meant for all people. And then the question would be, what does my faith and what does the Catholic intellectual tradition have to say to this uh, really important question? And I have to agree with Dr. Gale. I think for me, this is, is one of the most important life questions. You know, we talk about, you know, being pro-life and so on. For me, this is really a premier uh, pro-life question. We never really throw anything away. We never throw anything away. Pope Francis has said in his encyclical, we have created an immense pile of filth, immense pile of filth. And these are just a couple of pictures I've come across, the, uh, the plastic in the sea, the, the marine life that's all caught up in, in uh, plastic stuff, human-made stuff. Uh, a couple of years ago, I came across a, a picture of a bird that had died in its they said there were like there was like a pound and a half of plastic in its belly, uh, and from what I've read, eighty to ninety percent of of bird life in our world today has some kind of plastic in its system. Uh, and then, of course, the um, the huge uh, um, seas of of garbage in the in the oceans and in the waterways. I was walking the other day down Wailai, and there, there must have been 12 or 15 plastic bags filled with garbage. And I said to myself, where is this going to go? Where is this going to go? We just consume and we produce garbage. 
I was holding a, a plastic, in, in fact, uh, with Brother Ed, uh, we had a, 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 a coffee container, it's plastic. And I said to myself, in five years, where will this be? Now, if it's burned, the carbon will be in the atmosphere. If it is buried in landfills, it'll probably be much the same because it doesn't degrade, at least from my understanding, very quickly. And if it ends up in the, in the ocean, uh, it does degrade over a period of time. And then you have all these microplastics that get into the fish and then into the, uh, into the food uh, chain. So it's, uh, it's, it's a serious question. Uh, we have created an immense pile of filth. And do we ever really throw anything away? We get it out of our sight, um, but where does it go? Second. Change. Disproportionately affected by climate change. The worst impact is felt by those in developing countries, which have done the least to pollute the globe in the first place. So Western Europe, North America, we have developed uh, amazingly in the last 100, 150 years. And we have put a lot of um, very unsavory things into our environment. That's not true for so many of the developing countries, and yet the worst impact will be felt there. I was just listening today to uh, the radio on the way home. Uh, I had to go out to a store, and there was a, um, there was a presentation on NPR about a trade agreement between the United States and Kenya. And I was, I, it caught my attention because I had lived in Kenya, and I knew a bit about the social and economic situation. But as part of this, it's the first trade agreement that the US will make with Kenya. And as part of that agreement, Kenya has to agree to accept a massive amount of plastic garbage from the US. Now, Kenya banned uh, single use plastic uh, about three years ago, and it was amazingly important for the environment there. And yet this, this developing country, if they want trade, they also have to accept all this other stuff. And it will impact their, their life and their country. Global decisions that impact these countries, oil reserves, logging and drilling, arms, investment, trade, uh, those are decisions that are made in London, in Washington, in Paris, in uh, Berlin, that affect uh, developing countries adversely. These countries also have fewer financial resources to respond to the effects of climate change, it was why in the, in the Paris Agreement, uh, there was at least the push to have a, a substantial fund set aside to help uh, developing countries sustain themselves uh, as, uh, uh, as the impact of climate change was more severe. As well, poor populations near coastal areas. There were stories uh, earlier this year about Bangladesh being severely um, flooded. The islands, the Pacific Islands, and some Sahara Africa uh, uh, receiving uh, a significant impact from changes in, in uh, global climate. And the natural resources of these countries fuel the development of more wealthy countries, often the result of colonization. Laudato C is an environmental encyclical, but it's also an encyclical on the economy. And the Pope says that there is no magical conception of the market which privileges profits over the impact on the poor with the abuse of the environment. So he ties together how economies develop and what we are doing to the environment. And finally, as is becoming more and more um, uh, focused in our discussion, environmental racism. For instance, what, what happened in Flint, Michigan, it was a significantly, um, uh, it was the, the population of Flint and their, their water crisis there, it, it affected uh, people of color significantly. It didn't happen in, uh, in wealthier areas. The Mariana Islands, um, there's estimates that within 50 years, 
the sea levels there will rise a meter, which will cause 70 to 80 percent of the people to move inland or move off island because it can't sustain life. And then even the segregated housing here in, in Honolulu, and even with the impact of the uh, coronavirus, these are the areas that are impacted most. This is just a, a personal little thing that I wanted to add. Uh, for 13 years, I oversaw this large primary school in the slums of Nairobi, and we were dealing with really, really poor kids. We offered them the same kind of quality Marianist education that we do here at Chaminade. But this is where they came from. And this Makuru Kwanjenga slum was probably two miles long and uh, a mile wide. And it was home to 250,000 people. And you can imagine the kind of, of life, no electricity, no running water, uh, very, very difficult circumstances. People there are every bit as much um, motivated and entrepreneurial as people elsewhere but they're caught in, in uh, um, uh, systems of poverty, cycles of poverty that it's very difficult to break out of. And they are heavily impacted by changes in weather, by drought and so on. The third takeaway from the encyclical, less is more. Um, not every advancement um, affects the environment and human beings in positive ways. Uh, new pipelines, new refineries, new mines, new vehicles. Uh, Dr. Gale was talking about the electric vehicles, and uh, at least that's an improvement. Extreme consumerism, she also mentioned this, which benefits some but despoils the earth and impoverishes many. We have first world problems, first world problems. I, I have to smile a lot of times when uh, you know, there are complaints about this, that, or the other thing, you know, my air conditioning isn't working and, you know, my refrigerator isn't working and so on. Those, those are very first world problems. And one of the benefits I had in living where I've lived is uh, there's a certain perspective. Um, there's a, a, an extreme consumerism. When I first came home after two years in, actually in Nigeria, the thing that overwhelmed me was two things. One, the amount of clothing in stores in the malls, and number two, dog food in the supermarkets, where I was living with people who were hungry, and yet we cater to our dogs. That's nothing, nothing, about, nothing wrong with dogs and so on, but it's the disparity. The Pope urges decreased growth in some parts of the world so that other parts can develop in a healthy way, and that was this fund that was part of the, um, the climate agreement. There is a Christian spirituality of moderation and the capacity to be happy, happy with little. And the Pope says that we must re, uh, redefine our notion of progress. progress. As Gail said, everything is connected. We are part of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with it. In a Franciscan spirituality, there is an inseparable bond between concern for nature, justice for the poor, commitment to the society, and interior peace. And sadly, and this is where original sin comes in, selfishness and indifference erode a sense of the common good. And so the Pope ends his, uh, his encyclical by saying the cry of the earth is also the cry of the poor. I like this quote a lot, the human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together. We cannot adequately combat environmental degradation unless we attend to causes related to human and social degradation. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, the consequences uh, an integral ecology, which is also what Dr. Gale referred to. It's the intersection of the economy and ecology. So human beings and how we, uh, we uh, structure our life and the world and the, uh, the impact that we have upon it. We need an ecological conversion, a different worldview grounded in science and in faith. And as the Pope calls us to a bold cultural revolution. The ultimate values, human flourishing and the common good. That should lead us hopefully to some kind of action as Gail said. And I ended with where she began. That's the great blue marble. That uh, picture was taken on December 7th, 1972 on Apollo 17. And it reminds us that nothing ever leaves. We can't throw anything away. 
and we have been entrusted uh, with this as a sacred, and that's what the Pope says, as a sacred responsibility to keep this healthy for future generations. Wonderful, Father Marty, uh, thank you so much for that. And, uh, you know, there's so much, so much knowledge that's been shared so far uh, today. And um, for some of you, there, there may be some questions that you may have for uh, Dr. Gale or, or Father Marty on really any of this that they've shared so far with creation, the environment, our role, our responsibility um, as a society, as individuals, there may be a number of things that you may be wondering about. So what we want to do in, in parts of this Share the Joy isn't just um, for people to uh, present on something and then talk about something, but to have a dialogue. And so what we wanted to do in this uh, short amount of time, we, we wanted to have you guys to, to share or and or ask any questions to our presenters today for Dr. Gill, for Father Marty, on something that may have struck a chord with you today, something that um, made you think, oh, what about this? And what do you, what's your opinion on that? Or whatever it may be. So we wanted to take an opportunity to just have a QA and a uh, to open it up both for Dr. Gale or Father Marty. And so what I would say is um, if you have a question, you could do two options. You could put it in the chat box and then I could just read it out and then uh, direct it to a particular person. Or if you want, I think there's an option where you could raise a virtual hand and then you can ask in person uh, for any of the two. So let's go ahead, take a moment. And if you have any questions uh, or any comments, uh, please feel free to share that now. Okay, I see an actual hand uh, being raised uh, by Henry there. So Henry, go ahead, please. Um, I, I admire the optimism of both of our speakers. Um, I think Laudato Si is an absolutely remarkable document of, of you know, it'll, it'll be important for many, many generations. I was at this um, collegium a few years ago, the year that that meeting where I was representing Shamanad occurred just a week or so after the publication of Laudato Si. And there was so much enthusiasm for it. And it's really depressing to me how rapidly and, and uh, vigorously pushback came from governments and industries. And it's, it's had nowhere near the effect that we thought it was going to have when we were first so enthused by it. So I'm, I'm sorry to be so depressed, but I am. In that, Gail, your knowledge, values, action sequence, the knowledge is there, the ability to act is there, but there are value systems, there are a number of value systems in human society, and they are not all good. And how those value systems get approached, I think, is now our biggest challenge and i'm um i can't do it henry that's uh if i can uh, uh make a, a response i think you i think that's very good just uh, an fyi pope francis is coming out with another encyclical on the 4th of october on the human community so that might also be a, a, a very worthwhile thing there are many, many competing values. And within the Catholic community, my concern is that this is notched up in terms of a real life issue. If, if we don't solve this, if, if we can't manage this in some kind of constructive and faith-filled way, uh, a lot of the other issues won't make any difference. I, I, I'm going to add, I share, uh, Hank, the way you feel. I, I was even sad when the Laudato Si came out that it was on the news for about a week and then it vanished. And I've always just felt, you know, this is why I end up focusing on GDP so much. It's like the, the forces of 
the Keynesian economic model of growth, right, forever. I mean, you and I as ecologists, right, that just can't happen unless we can figure out how to grow an economy on not material items, you know? And so it, it is, I, I, the students also feel like it's just being squished, you know, by the, we call it the infrastructural inertia of making change to an economic model. That's why the gross national happiness, the fact that a few countries are just saying, look, there's way more that matters. Yeah. But it's that changing values and the values being the common good and the common good meaning respect everything and each other. Yeah. Yeah. So we just have to keep trying. I mean, we've just decided in class, we just have nothing but to keep trying, try to gather knowledge on what works better or, you know, the future doesn't look so great. I think one other thing, one thing that was very joyous to me out of this awful pandemic is that people realized how much they like to be outside and be in nature. So it brought it to the forefront. Oh, it matters to my well-being. <laughs> you know, we were taking it for granted. I mean, we, we were already, but maybe, maybe that's been a little awakening. I'm hoping for that. Absolutely, Dr. Gale. I, I think that is true for a lot of people. And uh, I remember, for example, uh, after the first shutdown, there, the, everything was, of course, closed. People weren't going out. Uh, even the hikes, uh, I remember going up to the AEA Loop. So if anybody hasn't been there, uh, God willing, when it opens up again, if uh, you know, I went out there for the first time. People hadn't been out there for a while. And nature itself, I think we have heard this a number of times, nature has had a break from us. <laughs> and, uh, and, and things started to come out. And I, I remember when the trail opened back up, you had to traverse the, uh, the parking areas and things like that, park outside of the, the hiking loop. But um, not a lot of people did it. I went out there and I can't tell you how many uh, pigs and boar and, uh, other animals, a lot of cats, plenty of cats that were over there as well, but all just so much nature was around and it was beautiful because it was, they were able to take a big breath, you know, and, and uh, I think it, it helped me to kind of see, you know, as I was running and, and on that trail, the, the rubbish that was on the side and just being able to do a little part, a little part of just picking it up and, and, and then taking it to, uh, you know, the, the proper places to dispose instead of out in the bushes or out in the, you know, in the forest. And so I think that is for those who, who wonder, it's like, well, what, what are some just little things that I could do? Oh my goodness. When we're, when, if and when we're able to get back out again is just be mindful of that. I think for me, I have to remind myself to be mindful of the things that's around me, to pick up the rubbish that's constantly in the beach and the, in the hikes, out in the ocean. When I go surf, I have an extra pocket just for rubbish that I see floating and I, I pick up. And almost every time I'm out, it's sad to say, but I bring back you know, rubbish from the ocean. So, um, but it's those little things you know, that I think we could do on a, on a daily basis. Very mindful during this time. Wonderful. Any other questions or comments for our, our speakers? Oh, I think I see a virtual. I can't see everybody's hands, but I do see one. Uh, Brother Ed. Yeah, so just uh, thank you very much, Gail and Father Marty. I think one of the things uh, that gives me hope is that, you know, when we brought uh, the characteristics of Mary Nest education were first put together, um, those were very inspiring to me as a Marianist. What I think I, I take hope in is that we have updated those and now we include service, justice, peace, and the integrity of creation in those characteristics. It's part of what I think is hopeful to me about both our educational process here at Chaminade and what I think um, is good about the charism. We can adapt this. We have to respond to new times. Um, and I think that's what's happening uh, in a real concrete way through uh, lots of initiatives. Um, I share Hank's, uh, you know, I gotta pull myself out sometimes of thinking like 
okay, where is this leading if I'm thinking about the bad part of it? But there are some signs of hope and there are some things that I think can be very helpful to us. And just the, uh, the uh, participation today by students, that's a sign of hope for me. Absolutely. Thanks, Brother Ed. I, I, I want to add the one thing I've seen happen over the past 20 years, and I've loved the, the Catholic Church has been amazing on climate change. I mean, I had one of those original, the bishops meet on climate change like 20 years ago. So, you know, that that's super encouraging. At first, uh, I, I mean, I grew up Catholic, but I'm also an evolutionary biologist. I was always upset with these perceived rifts and things, you know, and it's like, no, what's the difference between the human community and the natural community? None. It's the value system that says respect it all. And so uh, what I've seen lately that I really love from the environmental side is, you know, not just worrying about putting it all together, environmental justice. And like Father Marty's talking about, you know, countries where people don't get to see very much beauty at all, right? And survival, they're at the bottom of Maslow's triangle. We're, we're starting to see that how important it is for them, the environment and environmental justice in the U.S., like the Flint example, and just healthy, clean air, sort of the, the first world issues. They're coming together. When I first started being an environmentalist, it was like, oh, that's for wealthy people that care about species loss. Well, at least now we can say species loss, one of two matters utilitarian wise for ecosystems to work and us to have the benefit of the ecosystem services. But we can also say it's it's a moral argument about the, the right to exist, you know, the value. I always like that God saw that it was good. Sometimes I just fall back on that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, or we can say, oh, it matters for the ecosystem, but they're all kind of coming together as people are starting to see they're really one issue, how we treat each other and the planet, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, Dr. Gill. Thank you. And thank you, Brother Ed, for that. Well, wonderful. Um, just to respect everybody's time, we, we wanted to start to uh, this program and, and end it uh, within an hour. And so it, it is at uh, 501 right now, and we want to be able to let the students go grab some dinner or whatever else they're going to do, probably go study. Um, I can hear people laughing in the background. Uh, but we just wanted to say uh, a huge mahalo to Dr. Gail and Father Marty. Um, if you're interested in the conversation to, to continue this on, I'm very much, I'm, I'm very sure that Dr. Gail and Father Marty will be available to uh, speak with you privately if, um, or a group of you that would like to, to share this and, and continue on the conversation. Um, for the contacts for Father Marty or Dr. Gale, that could be found on the website. But if you want, you could just email me as well, and I'll, I'll make sure that you get those uh, those out there, their contact information, and uh, they could set something up, or you could set something up with them. I think that would be uh, a wonderful thing. And uh, again, I, they're very much open to this. This is not a one-time kind of thing. This is something that is a daily concern. And 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 again, to bring a sense of joy in the midst of all this. We understand the implications. We've talked about that today. But really the joy that we're in this together to be able to support one another and support our world. And, and really, to me, the, the real joy I find here is that God has given us this gift of creation. And he's given us the stewardship to be good stewards to this gift and what a great gift it has been and it will be and we have each other to continue to support it and take care of it and, and each other of course um, before we end here i uh, wanted to have an opportunity where we could share uh, a little bit of some upcoming events so just a couple announcements uh, here coming up for uh, this thursday uh, there's the 20, uh, 1220 training with Pono Riddle. All this is going to be on the events calendar, by the way, but we just want to be able to share this with our students real quick uh, before we, we break off here to give you guys an opportunity to get connected. Because I know we all know it's been a little bit of a challenge connecting uh, with, with other people, with the universities. So again, these events are up and coming, great ways to connect. So tomorrow, Thursday, the 1220 training with Pono Riddle, you could read a little bit more about that on the events calendar. Uh, 9-11 is this Friday. Uh, we're going to have a memorial prayer service at 1030 a.m. It's going to be live stream from MRO, from Mystical Rose Oratory, but please join us for a very short memorial service. It's going to take probably about 20 minutes of your time, but I think it'll be meaningful for you, 
meaningful if you're able to make it out 10:30 a.m go on the events calendar you can see a link to watch the live stream and, and participate with us wherever you may be uh, also on sunday we have our sunday mass at 10 a.m but also at 6.30 for students. So any students who are interested as well, we have a 6.30 evening mass for you uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, also next week on the 14th and 16th, there'll be a flu clinic from 9 a.m. Uh, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. on that Tuesday, excuse me, the Monday. And then on the 16th, the flu clinic will be 2 p.m to 4 p.m. Again, that's going to be on the events calendar. Sign up. If you haven't got your uh, your vaccine or your flu shot just yet, uh, think about trying to get that. That is open to students and faculty and staff, but you need a RSVP for that. Uh, also on the 14th, OSAL has a leaderscape, a leadership courageous dialogue that will be taking place at 630. I believe Joseph is on here with us. If he may want to share, Joseph, if you're there, you can share a little bit more on that. If not, uh, we... oh, there he is. Um, so Monday the 14th at 6.30 is the Courageous Dialogue program in partnership with Leadership, a local nonprofit. Um, and this is in partnership with Campus Ministry, um, CSPB, as well as the Dean of Students. Um, it is a one-of-a-kind workshop to learn a little bit about um, Courageous Dialogue and conversations during um, challenging times and topics on things like race, injustice, um, COVID-19, etc. Awesome. Thanks, Joseph, for that. So again, that's on the 14th at 6.30. Uh, we also have a fourth night, which is a uh, large group of, well, in the past, large group of students who come together and share on topics of dealing with life or spirituality, uh, relationships, all kinds of stuff. I'm not sure what the topic's gonna be for this coming Monday, but it's a great opportunity to connect with other students, meet other students virtually. For more information on that, you can check out uh, Campus Ministry website or our Instagram at COH Ministry. Also, um, only two more things here. On Friday, the 18th will be our fall spiritual convocation for the entire campus community. Um, it is gonna be something that we are doing in person, but we ask you to please RSVP by this week, uh, excuse me, by this week or next week uh, to be able to get you a reserve a spot for you. So that's gonna be next Friday, the 18th, Fall Spiritual Convocation. We're gonna have a, an address by Dr. Bevington, our president, and uh, also we'll, it's gonna be just a beautiful time for us to finally come together um, and just ask the gift of the Holy Spirit to protect us, to guide us in this year of all the things that's going on. So please join us, Fall Spiritual Convocation, on the 18th, Friday, it's gonna be at 1 p.m., but just RSVP for that. Lastly here, the next Share the Joy is next Wednesday. We just wanted to say thank you so much for coming up to this one. Please tell your friends about the next one for next Wednesday. Uh, next Wednesday. We're gonna have our very own brother Ed Brink share his joy, his stories of encouragement and hope and joy with us. We're very much looking forward to that. Same time next week, 4 p.m. Uh, very much looking forward to it. Again, God bless you guys. Before we end, I will just uh, offer one last prayer here, uh, again from La Dalto C, and we'll just close in that, in that blessing from God. So we begin in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we praise you for all your creatures. They came forth from your wonderful hand, they are yours, filled with your presence and your tender love. Praise be to you. Son of God, Jesus, through you all things were made. You were formed in the womb of Mary, our mother. You became part of this earth, and you gazed upon this world with human eyes. Today, you are alive in every creature in your risen glory. Praise be to you. Holy Spirit, by your light, you guide this world towards the Father's love and accompanying creation as it groans in travail. As you also dwell in our hearts and you also inspire us to what is good. Praise be to you. Triune Lord, wondrously, wondrous community of infinite love, teach us to contemplate you and the beauty of the universe for all things speak to you. Awaken our praise and thankfulness 
for every being that you have made. Give us the grace to feel profoundly joined in everything that is. God of love, show us our place in, the, in this world as channels of your love for all, crea all crea creatures of this earth, for not one of them is forgotten in your sight. Enlighten those who possess power and money that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for this world in which we live. Lord, seize us with the, your power and light. Help us to protect all life, to prepare for a better future, for the coming of your kingdom of justice, peace, love, and beauty. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all very much again. That was an extremely long prayer, I realized. So thank you for being a part of that. And wherever you may be, guys, don't forget, continue to love, support one another, and of course, share the joy. God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Gail. Thank you, Father oh, my Marty. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, dear one. Thank <laughs> you. Hi, guys. Be well. Yes. <laughs> Aww.